controversial on GitHub. I won't spend too much time on that one because we have a separate session, I believe, tomorrow about that. Uh, but uh, I will just highlight some things that I see as an important element why PowerShell on GitHub is even better than PowerShell on Linux. Uh, so uh, that's something that I, I think uh, uh, was uh, mentioned during the, the during this presentation just before lunch. So PowerShell evolved all the time. We started with this caterpillar. It was uh, uh, kind of shaky and you had this optional feature on Windows Server 2008. You could potentially download it and install it on other operating systems, but it wasn't guaranteed to be there. You couldn't really go to any Windows box and just type in PowerShell and expect it to work. You are actually on the opposite uh, side of the spectrum. You would type in PowerShell and see such command doesn't exist. It's like, uh, back to CMD or VBScript, whatever. But uh, there was also one thing, but uh, another thing was that it was kind of locked down. So it couldn't really do much with PowerShell V1. You really had to use WMI or any uh, technology that did support remoting to get outside of the box that you launched this PowerShell on. Therefore, you will were not really able to use it for really like uh, uh, actual business cases, scenarios at work. Oh, thank you. I forgot about that one. Uh, so then we got uh, to PowerShell version 2 uh, in 2009, which was very awesome because it became part of OS. But it also made it very locked and locked, and you, you couldn't really update it on a regular basis. You had this, you had to wait three years to get version 3. It was like, oh my god, we have so many bugs, so many features that we would like to, to use in PowerShell, but we can't because we had to wait for uh, server 2012 to show up. Uh, so even though it was guaranteed, so it was way better because you could go to any Windows box, well, modern enough, that uh, had PowerShell on it and just run it and it would work. Uh, but it was still not the best shape you could get. And then uh, we are here now where the butterfly starts to, you know, come out of this cocoon. So we have PowerShell that can run on any platform, well, any operating system, and platforms may be too much. Uh, so you can run it on Linux, Mac OS, uh, you can run it on, on Windows, obviously, as well. Uh, and it's also, uh, it's flexible. So you have this cycle of, uh, let's see, this is the problem, you fix it, and then you, that's the problem, you fix it, it's so close to each other, so you have uh, fixes within months, not three years waiting for the next version. Um, so that's how PowerShell evolved over time. Uh, and that's where I guess the presentation will kind of hang for now. I usually don't do too much slides. Let's move on to demos. So I did mention this PowerShell on Linux. So let's go to PowerShell on Linux. Uh, okay. Um, so basics. Um, by the way, how many of you already used PowerShell on Linux? Install it. Awesome. So you probably know most of the things I will show. Sorry. So, uh, yeah, the zoom level is probably fine by now. Let's see, just to, just to be sure that I can get it. Okay, it's fine. Um, so one of the beauties about PowerShell is that it's able to talk to any uh, data source, I would say. Maybe not any, but so many uh, data sources that you can easily hook it up with uh, XMLs, JSONs, uh, with uh, any formats that you can come up with. It's usually there's a commandlet that will allow you to read this data file. And my pony uh, is XML, obviously. For some of you that uh, attended the last year, uh, uh, last year conference, you know that. Uh, so let's try to use that. So I'll first define this uh, XPath query that I will use, control one, don't forget about that, Bartek. And then we will try to, uh, what I'm doing here is actually uh, the firewall D has uh, a lot of XML documents, basically on Linux you have some XMLs present and they, they define a lot of things. So you can actually use uh, the, the partial to parse those very easily. I'm pretty sure that there are other tools on Linux that allow you to do the same, but 
frankly speaking, uh, I know PowerShell well enough to actually use it in this situation. Another thing that you get with PowerShell on Linux is that you can actually have uh, things that normally work on, on Windows uh, PowerShell. So you ha have uh, tab completion for users. For example, here I have a function that I wrote myself, so you can write your own functions that kind of wrap what, whatever you would do on Linux. And you can actually uh, also provide tab expansion for that. Actually, I have a session about that on Friday, I believe. And um, you don't even have to use uh, too much PowerShell in there if you know a little bit of uh, of Linux commands you can just use those Linux commands to your advantage so here I actually the way I get those the list of the users on the system is I'm using the cut which is like designed to do exactly that uh, so you can you don't you are not forced to use PowerShell everywhere all the time you can still use the existing tools that exist on the on the Linux and PowerShell, uh, sorry, on Linux, and just just uh, use them within PowerShell. Okay, let's move back to the demos. Yep. So I, because I wrote this function, I can just see the script block for it. I actually seen it before because I opened uh, it in the editor. So generally, as you can see, it's just like any PowerShell. So you can have command-based based help. You can have normal parameters. You can uh, specify things like supports, wildcards. And in, in it, you just can use PowerShell. And you obviously, you can mix it up with uh, any Linux tools that you have. Uh, so here, I'm just going to get help for that because I wrote this, this very, very basic uh, command-based help for it. So I can still use the same uh, approach that I had in the past. Let's try to make it there. Yeah, so as you can see, it's just it provides you the same amount of, of information that you would got from the uh, PowerShell, uh, PowerShell windows. And it allows you to talk to the web APIs, especially REST APIs. It's very good with that. So here I'm trying to get some uh, information about the posts. Uh, no about the posts that I had about Linux on my Polish PowerShell blog. Uh, PowerShell blog. I didn't have so many, apparently. I just discovered that when I was running this API, which is kind of sad. Anyway, uh, I'm just co talking to REST API using PowerShell, and it's super simple, and it won't work because the internet. Um, <laughs> sorry, I forgot about that one. Um, anyway. Um, in normal circumstances, without, without all this uh, gibberish and the problems with the screens, I would be able to, to, to go to the menu and connect to the Wi-Fi. But this uh, icon is on the first screen over there, so I cannot really see it and click it and connect. So, yeah, sorry. Uh, but anyway, trust me on that one, that would normally work. You can also use PowerShell Gallery. So, yeah, again, find module probably won't fly. But... I installed, fortunately, one of the modules from Gallery. Thank God I didn't uh, dare to actually do it on stage, else it wouldn't work at all. So I have this uh, PSE, and the PSE is one of the many modules that exist in Gallery. The problem with the problem with modules in Gallery is that they assume that you have Windows PowerShell on your box. So you have two potential problems. First problem is that uh, the module that you will install on Linux from PowerShell Gallery basically won't work because it depends on the, uh, the .NET classes or APIs that exist as only in the full PowerShell.NET, uh, sorry, uh, .NET framework. Uh, the, the second situation is where it kind of works, but doesn't provide you any uh, advantage because it just targets the things that you would do on Windows. But there are some examples like PSINI, which is a relatively simple module that uh, was designed to work with any files. And if any of you work with Linuxes, you know that uh, some of the configuration files in Linux are actually structured exactly like any files. So, uh, for example, uh, the repos um, would just uh, be that. Uh, let's go here. So, one of the things that you need before you can install uh, PowerShell or Visual Studio Code, and I kind of skipped one demo, for, unfortunately, but that won't fly because of the internet problems. So I, was, I had this demo where I installed the PowerShell first, but 
I would need to download that from <laughs> from internet. No, pro no, no way to do that now. So um, one thing that you need to you need to configure the repos, and you need to to be able to talk to those repos. Um, so here I have. I just read this uh, ini file in a format that uh, that PowerShell uh, it actually converts your ini file to hash table with each uh, segment represented as a keyword and underneath it you have all the properties as a like uh, hash tables as well. Uh, therefore, if you want to modify it, you can just go there, change the value in the hash table, which is a relatively simple thing to do in PowerShell, and then dump it back to disk and change this ini file. It, for this simple uh, s example like this one, it doesn't make any sense because you can just open VI and just edit it there. But in situation where you really want to do that, do that at scale, or you want to really be, uh, make some logic around it, so you like if that the value is that you want to move it to something uh, to one value. If it's different, then you want to move to a different value. Then you would need that logic written somehow, and uh, then you can do just do that in PowerShell. One. Um, so let's just to be sure that I don't have the file that I want to create now. The so uh, if I would like to create this Visual Studio Code, that, that's how I do that. I just write the hash table that has uh, the single key code, which will be converted to this uh, square bracket name, square bracket, so the, the header, header in the ini file. And underneath it, I have all this key value pairs. Uh, that will just just live under the, the the keyword. So if I want to define the repo for Visual Studio Code, I would just do that like this, and then I can just dump it to the file with the out ini file uh, command. And once it's done, I can just see that it actually created the uh, valid uh, configuration file for the repo. Okay, so that's that. Um, and I did mention that uh, there are some uh, cloud providers that already started to, to take advantage of that, uh, of PowerShell. Actually, uh, Jeffrey mentioned that as well. So we have uh, Azure RM Profile Netcore. We actually have three profile, uh, three, sorry, three modules from Azure that you can use to talk to it with the PowerShell Core, which means you can actually run those on Linux as well. Uh, the problem with this module, and to be honest, I, and when I first saw it, it's like, you gotta be kidding me, why would you ever do that? So what they do, they would change your verbose prefer preference to continue, so any verbose output from now on will show up on your screen. And the reason they do that, I won't be able to show it now, but it, login, login Azure RM account, normally it would launch your browser, right, on, on, on Windows. The tricky part with Linux is that you don't even know what br browser people may have. So you don't want to re like go wild and just launch, like check if it Firefox is there, check if Opera is there, check if uh, I don't know whatever people use these days on Linux uh, exists. So you don't want to go to this uh, like guesswork. So what the the team did is they in ver verbose output they will actually show you the URL that you have to go to. Maybe that will work. Actually, maybe we can try that. I mean, the URL itself won't work, but I believe that uh, the maybe the uh, the feedback will at least give me something. Uh, I guess it connects to Azure first and then provides the verbose output. Um, anyway, so in this output, you actually get the URI that you have to go to, with which uh, in the modern uh, uh, modern consoles you just just control click it. You go to the your favorite browser or the browser that's default, at least. And uh, then you just have to type in the, the, the code that it will provide to you. And then it kind of matches the, your session on, in PowerShell with your Azure account. So you have to be logged into your Azure account with the browser. And then you just can, can create it. And obviously, you can get this uh, uh, saved as, uh, as, uh, XM, uh, as JSON and then just, just select Azure RM profile. And that also works and I won't be able to show you because of the internet problems. But anyway, that would normally work. So yeah, if you really want to stay sane, the first thing you would do after you connect is turn off this terrible behavior. So yeah, you don't want to see any verbose output. I, you, if you want to see it, you will ask for it. You don't want 
to get variables output for any command that you run. Uh, so normally I would just do the select. I think the select will work because it just reads the XML and then it just has some metadata about uh, uh, my connection token, but the next command won't work, unfortunately. So we will skip this one. Uh, I don't have anything in Azure, uh, sorry, in uh, Amazon Web Sub, uh, Web, uh, sorry, AWS, uh, but just to show you uh, how hard they work on this. So I think that there's one-to-one, one-to-one uh, uh, um, relation between uh, the .NET Core and the full version of the AWS uh, PowerShell, because the number of commandlets is astonishing. It's just uh, it looks like uh, all the things that you would co could come up with regarding uh, managing AWS with PowerShell is actually there. And with that, let's move to the, my next demo, which hopefully will work because I will work with a private cloud for a change. So, play. So next off, I will show you some VMware stuff because VMware was uh, also the first one to arrive to to PowerShell, well, with the exception of Exchange Team maybe, um, and they did almost the same with .NET Core version of PowerShell. So even for .NET Core version of PowerShell, it's still not production ready; it's still in alpha stage. You already have uh, some uh, modules for PowerShell uh, running on that. So let's just run the That's the tricky part where I type, type in my passwords. Uh, so we will attempt to connect to the uh, ASXI host running on my laptop. We'll see how that goes. As you can see, I managed to connect to it, but that's, that's not the only thing I can do on it. Uh, I can, uh, oh, um, I'm not sure how that works in your organization, but in our organization, until recently, the certificate on the, uh, on the um, vCenter was not trusted by anything and it shouldn't be because it was still science certificate, 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 thank you. Um, so, <laughs> Normally, uh, in a uh, Power CLI on Windows, it will just warn you about it. The problem is with this one is that it actually crashes. So it will just error out on the not trusted certificate. So what you want to do probably if you, ha if, if you are in the situation where uh, the Power CLI or sorry, uh, vCenter or any host that you connect to don't provide you the valid certificate that you trust, you probably want to go there. And also on Linux, certification certificates are not really super clear uh, so there are multiple ways to to trust certificate one uh, uh, there's a, like the, the global store for the system but some some modules actually will use something di completely different so just to be sure you probably want to set it to ignore uh, invalid certificates once you do that you can start reading data you can read information about VM host uh, you can read about information about the disks uh, you can obviously uh, see all the VMs that you have on this uh, uh, on this uh, vCenter or in this case uh, SXI host. You can see virtual switches that you have configured. So all those things that you normally would do in PowerShell Live uh, running on the full .NET, you can also do here. Uh, the coverage is not obviously 100% yet, but they're working hard on making it so. And I think it's not that hard because uh, what uh, Parcel I in the end does it just just kind of wrap up the API calls, so it shouldn't be that hard to convert it to the .NET Core version of uh, PowerShell. Uh, so our good old friend GetView still works, and it works the way you would expect it to. And you can also modify things, so it's not something I would recommend because even VMware doesn't recommend it very much because what they say on the page where you can download this PowerShell I button core is that it's not production. So I suspect if you would do that like that and they will figure it out, then you, and you call, you, you create a support call with them, they will say, "Oh, you did it with PowerShell I core. Sorry, bye." So you probably want to be careful of this, but still, 
in my limited uh, virtual environment, it actually worked just fine. And it supports things like what if, so you, all, the, all, the, all the goodies that you have in PowerShell, the safe bi safe, safety belts that you have are working as expected. Yeah. That's the demo number two. Pretty good in time. That's probably because I had to skip the first demo entirely, but still. <laughs> uh, So this is the PowerShell on Linux. Now for PowerShell on GitHub. So um, it's not about PowerShell on GitHub so much as more about PowerShell that is open source that you as a uh, community uh, member can, first of all, you can report any bug or any problem that you have with it and that's one thing. So you can be this passive, uh, hopefully not passive aggressive, but passive member of community that will just report the box and report the problems with PowerShell. But the second thing that you can do as a member of community, if you are smart enough and you are skilled enough to do that, you can actually just, just pick up some issues that somebody else reported. PowerShell team, as, far as, uh, as I know, if they see the problem, but they don't see a really good need to do that now, they will flag those things up for grabs. Therefore, somebody from community can just jump in and just, just do his magic and makes, make, make it so. Uh, so you're not only able to uh, sub support partial team in a sense that you will just report stuff, you can also go there and just fix the problems that others suffer from. And maybe you are suffering from that too. It's like, you see this in issue on the GitHub, it's like, oh yeah, I, I remember that one. Let's just, just see if I can actually do something in C-sharp and just fix it for everybody else as well. So it's previously we would, what we would do, we would create some proxy functions in uh, some modules or we would uh, uh, have some special commands for ourselves like get child item X that does something special more than, than the usual get child item. Now we can just go there to the GitHub repo and just fix it for everybody else so everybody else can take advantage of whatever we see as a problem or whatever we think that we may fix. So let's go back to uh, Visual Studio Code. Uh, it's supposed to be closed. It's not. Okay. Yeah, all this magic of the disappearing screen kind of uh, still a lot of my time before the session, so I couldn't really get everything in the shape that I would like it to be. <coughs> So, uh, let's just open one of the examples, one of the issues on, yeah, let's do that in the windows. Uh, yeah, but put that too, because we won't be able to see it. So yeah, as you can see, I'm moving mouse over there, it appears, but it never comes back until I just move it here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm afraid I won't show you, I won't be able to show you this uh, bug report now, because uh, Again, demo dots. I probably was not kind of in good communication with them for the last few days, and they just decided to hit me hard today. <laughs> anyway, um, so this issue was about, um, I believe that was issue about the select uh, select object minus expand property. So somebody reported that there is a problem with the uh, select object uh, that if you specify expand property uh, you cannot really see the properties of the incoming object you see them when you say minus property so if you do stuff like um, I don't know sell it, get child item and then you try to select object minus property and you specify some property like I don't know last right time it works right but if you try the same with expand property, it just doesn't know what to do with it. It's small, it's not really like end of the world, but still it's kind of painful, right? Because I, I'm not sure how you often you use uh, expand property, but I got annoyed by this problem every time I did it because I, I'm, I'm terrible at typing and my colleague sitting somewhere there probably will confirm that I'm Mr. Typo at work. Uh, so i terrible at typing, so tab completion is not a uh, nice feature for me. It's just like a must. Um, 
and not having it for something like expand property is kind of painful. So um, that's where the community helps. And I think this one actually was solved by the by uh, by PowerShell team. So as you saw, this one doesn't work. This one won't. Mind. Let me just check quickly if I, have, I hope I have PowerShell downloaded somewhere. Because I do want to upgrade to version above. I think I did download it. Yeah, because I want to show you that it doesn't work now, but there was a fix for that. And there, the, after I'm currently on this laptop, I have uh, version 17 installed, so alpha 17. Uh, and in alpha 18, it was actually fixed. Just move on to uh, the uh, console where I actually can see the folders differently. That would help a lot. Mm. Okay, yeah, so I guess that's the one. Yep. But I want to install one version. So normally you would be able to say uh, sudo yum yum uh, minus y uh, update PowerShell and it will download the PowerShell 18 from the uh, from the repo. Uh, the problem is that without internet that doesn't really work very well. So I will just try to do that locally. And it launches the thing. Most stuff. Um, Eventually, we should get our PowerShell. Okay, I uh, will probably wait. Okay, um, let's move back here. So hopefully, eventually, it will just came to senses and give up on the checking, checking all these things. And just install it for me while we are at it. Um, yeah, the next one won't fly too. Um, so yeah, we can use PowerShell also to to, to list those those uh, uh, issues. And here I'm I'm actually listing the pull requests because so that's the the second part. Because this one was actually somebody reported the problem, so the select object minus expand property didn't work for this person, uh, but he didn't fix it himself. Uh, PowerShell didn't team that as as far as I know. But there was also, uh, this is another example, I think that Dev Wyatt realized that join path behaves not the way he would expect it to. So it works fine on the Windows because you can say join path to the root folder and then you specify the like all the children underneath it and it kind of joins the things, two things together. The problem is that if you move to the Xplot PowerShell, you don't even know what the separator for the path will be. It will be slash or backslash. And you don't want to really do the guesswork. So the solution would be, you join the path for the first first two elements, then you join path again and again and again, you kind of build up to the whole path. Uh, so they thought, okay, that's not convenient, that's not perfect way to do that, I want to do that differently. So he posted uh, not only uh, he posted an issue, he also posted the code that fixes the issue and makes join path behave like he was expecting to, to, to it to behave. So. Uh, that's fortunately in the previous one of the previous alphas it was fixed, so we don't have to do wait for the internet to work uh, for it to, to, to work for us now. But as you can see here, I'm just specifying I want to start with etc and then I'll, I want to add yums repo to, d to that, and I want to see the vs code dot repo, and it will just combine all those things together using the proper separator for the given provider. So even if it's running on Linux, it will use the uh, slash. If it's on Windows, it will use backslash. I'm always confused the two. Uh, but the point is here that it was not the PowerShell team member, it was a community member uh, that fixed the problem. And it fixed the problem not him for himself. So it's not like somewhere private for himself. No, it's, it, everybody can take advantage of this fix. I'll just check quickly if we got anything from the PowerShell. No, it still, still tries to get some errors. So I don't think it will actually break. Yeah. 
Um, so looks like I'm finished now. <laughs> it's, yeah, I was planning to, to have much more demos, but some of them it just didn't happen because of the internet problems and general laptop problems. So be sure that I will sure that for the next uh, presentation I will prepare more and make sure that my laptop actually responds to the uh, input and doesn't create some virtual screens on the side. Uh, but uh, if you are interested in the subject, you probably want to see more sessions. And uh, for that, I, because I don't have internet again, I cannot really get agenda item uh, like that. But I fortunately added the cached parameter. So I saved the JSON to desk to be able to, to read it here on the stage. Uh, so as you can see, there are some other sessions that you may want to attend. I, I filtered it only on Linux and uh, XSplat. And the only reason I added XSplat to the search uh, I'm not sure if Ben is in the room. There you are. It's because this guy didn't use Linux word in his Linux presentation. He just said expat. Come on. Uh, but yeah, anyway, <laughs> uh, you see all those uh, se sessions. And you can see that there is a pattern there. So I strongly encourage you to go to the rotor cell tomorrow morning and just stay there for the remaining of the like morning part. Because then you will have first Joey talking about the uh, open source and uh, I think uh, generally about uh, how the power partial will evolve over time then you have Ben on stage with demos that probably work like Myers, mine and uh, the next off I have uh, interesting presentation about uh, uh, PowerShell uh, actually Linux talking to Windows uh, without PowerShell being so much involved I have some uh, a small demo about PowerShell remoting, but I leave it to, to, to the experts, so Ben will show you more about that. Uh, my presentation will focus mainly on how would you do that today. Uh, and today means that probably you won't get approval to install Alpha PowerShell on your production machines, I assume, I hope, to be honest. Uh, so how would you do that with Python and Python RAM? And I will drill into details and fortunately for that one, I don't need internet so much, so it should be just fine. Um, any questions, by the way? That's the tricky part. So, um, uh, to summarize the whole uh, presentation, yep, oh, sorry. You just install it with MSI and side by side installation. That's the beauty of, of it. It's actually even better than Linux. So, uh, how it uh, installs on Windows, as really, at least from my experience, it will create a folder for each version. So, if you want to test Alpha 17 and 18 at the same time, it actually puts them in the separate folders. Therefore, you have to go to you have to know where to go to actually run the, the correct one. Uh, so, if you just type in like Control X and just type in PowerShell, you will get the default one. But you can still open the, the, um, the version 6 on, on Windows, and it works pretty, pretty well. Any other question? Um, so, to summarize this, uh, this session, uh, I want to say nightmare, but yeah, <laughs> let's not go that far. Um, to summarize the session, uh, first of all, uh, PowerShell is evolving, and uh, sometimes it's the evolution is more like a revolution for, for some folks. Uh, but we started with this uh, really like uh, gloomy and not very uh, uh, present and useful uh, PowerShell. It was already kind of decent, but it wasn't really solving our problems. Then we moved to the PowerShell that was solving the problems, but it was solving the problems and uh, unless you had the new feature request or you had a problem with some uh, existing existing commands and uh, it was solving them only on Windows or any uh, platform that actually exposes some a API. So yes, you could manage some storage devices or VMware infrastructure, uh, but you couldn't really uh, manage everything with it. And you couldn't run it everywhere. So you couldn't, on your Mac OS, you couldn't really just start PowerShell and just run things in it. You really had to have uh, uh, Windows machine, at least as a small VM that runs somewhere on the side and you don't look at it unless you really have to. 
to get the PowerShell running. Um, PowerShell is everywhere. That's another big thing that you should remember. It's not just Windows anymore. And I think that's uh, like a uh, very important thing because um, when I have discussions at work and I'm in the team that I'm the only Windows guy uh, in the whole team, uh, discussion usually end up with the, okay, but we can install Python on Windows and we cannot really do that on, with uh, PowerShell on Linux. So let's just use Python for everything because then we don't have to rewrite our, rewrite our code. Um, and well, with this change, we I can actually say that's not true anymore. I can install PowerShell on your Linux, no problem. If you don't know how to solve it in Python, I can solve it for you in PowerShell. Isn't it good? Um, and the third thing, I think that the most important part, uh, and I hope that you will take it home with you, it's PowerShell is yours to take. I mean, it's not just PowerShell team that ma maintains or uh, actually they still maintain, but it's not just PowerShell team that uh, is um, building this, this this product. It's not just PowerShell team that is uh, responsible for putting the code in the PowerShell. Uh, the PowerShell these days is a shared, board, shared uh, effort between uh, PowerShell team and us, uh, scripters or uh, developers, whatever whatever your role, their role is. You can just go to GitHub repo, clone it. Uh, and if you see something that you can fix, uh, and it's maybe not that important for the majority of the community, but you still suffer from it, you can at least uh, report as that as an issue because maybe there are other people that will be able to fix it for you and others. But also, if you see, feel like it and you have, the again, the knowledge and the skills required to do that, uh, you can just pick up the, the issue that exists or just create your own and just try to write the code that will fix the problem uh, because, well, now you can. And I think that's, uh, that's, the, like, that's the huge change uh, uh, for Microsoft uh, in general because you see that all over the place. It's not just PowerShell that is being out open source. Uh, the .NET open sourcing was the huge thing. I think for the majority of the world, uh, much bigger than the open sourcing PowerShell for us. Uh, open source and PowerShell was, was uh, probably more important because, well, we kind of use .NET, but we don't use that explicitly. We kind of use it as a implicitly when we run PowerShell. Uh, so I strongly encourage you to just go to GitHub and try to find uh, the, 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 the spot that you belong to and just try to, to make it better, not just for yourself, but for others too. So if you have some side project that you kind of dropped because you felt that it w nobody will ever use it, so you have uh, written this, uh, I don't know, some proxy functions or whatever uh, that solves a uh, commandlet that uh, doesn't behave the way you would like it to behave. You can always just, just you know, open the editor again, just see the code. Maybe there's, uh, there's, it's possible to, that it will be possible, doable for you to do the same in the C-sharp code and just get it there and create pull requests. If it won't fly in immediately, maybe somebody from the team will actually take it and just say, okay, that doesn't really work. I need to do that better and maybe write some tests for you for that. But you know, you, at least if you show this effort, there is a chance that the fixes that you were hoping for to get, like for me, that's a perfect example is new web service proxy that doesn't support proxy uh, um, at all. So it, it's kind of weird because the name would suggest that it supports proxies, but it doesn't. And it's painful. I, have, I don't think it actually this command that exists in the PowerShell core. Uh, anyway, um, but there are some other pain points that you will eventually find or you already found and you can definitely uh, jump in and just fix it for you and for others. Um, so, yeah, uh, I guess I started a bit uh, earlier than this, so my clock tells me that I have five minutes left, so you still have some questions, I'm here, okay. So the question is, uh, what's the difference between a uh, PowerShell that you get in the Windows 10 and the PowerShell that you download from the GitHub repo? Um, the difference is that on the Windows, you get Windows PowerShell. So it's 5.1, I believe, at the moment. Uh, the one that you download from the GitHub repo is PowerShell, dot, uh, PowerShell Core, I think that's the name. Uh, and it's version 6. And it's uh, uh, 5.1 is production. 6.0 is alpha 18 or is 19 already? 
Yeah, it changes. It's another thing. The, if you if you look at the um, PowerShell.NET Core, uh, sorry, PowerShell Core, uh, it's so rapidly changing. You get releases almost every every month, I believe. And uh, with each release, you get fixes. That you know, uh, what I wanted to demo. To try to see if it actually works. Uh, I said we wanted to show you that it works, but uh, I guess I won't be able to. Um, <laughs> I guess it wanted to download some some, uh, uh, some dependencies as well on top of <laughs> just PowerShell. Uh, nice. Um, so the thing I wanted to show you that actually I had the version 17 and I started uh, working on my presentation with this one. Meanwhile, so it's like two, within two months, somebody reported this back of the select uh, select object minus property, uh, sorry, expand property. And before I know it, it was already fixed and, and released. So it's really, the loop is very close to the customer or the person that actually needs the fix to be uh, implemented. So you, anything you, you, you put in there has a big chance to be fixed, not within three years, but within a month, if it's easy enough fix. Yes, Jeffrey. Uh, you mean the drawings I was showing in presentation? Fortunately, I don't have to draw myself because that will be way better, as uh, way worse. Sorry, that are coming from my kids. So you mean this one, for example? Yeah, it's actually this is my three-year-old daughter. Uh, she, she, I didn't want her to draw something for me. Because that would be just like lines and lines and lines. So I just printed the question mark and asked her to color it. Uh, but the previous pictures, yes, they were coming from my uh, elder two. I especially like this one because it really looks like this GitHub cat's octopus thing, right? Any other question? Um, yes, so I'm not in position to answer this question. You have a better, better people behind you that will probably give you this answer. But my, my pos okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, I had the same feeling when I was watching the, uh, Jeffrey's presentation. It's like, oh, I, I, was, I was about to say that and that and that. I think uh, the, the, the problem with this one is that we all share the same passion and love for this partial direction at the moment. I'm not sure that everybody has the same uh, uh, feeling, but for me, personally, I was uh, actually, I started with uh, Linuxes, and then I got hired by a company that was Windows shop only, um, and I had to start writing CMD scripts. Uh, and one day, there was like, you know, I, I, I sorry? Uh, the question is, do I still wake up screaming? No, fortunately, the, uh, the PowerShell story wiped this memory entirely. And actually, I, I managed to, to squeeze every little snippet of CMD that you could potentially find, uh, but uh, it was still not there, right? So, so the PowerShell was actually, you know, it was the breath of fresh air, but it was also the fact because it, I was always the command line person, not the GUI person. So I felt, okay, finally, Microsoft got it. And now they are getting it back to Linux. So I have a good excuse to have Linux VMs like this one, just to run PowerShell on it. Any more questions? Okay, thank you very much. Sorry for the uh, disturbance in force. Uh, it wasn't intentional, <laughs> as you can probably guess. Um, but yeah, I hope that I will get, uh, I, I mean, once I get the internet connection on my laptop and I get uh, the, to see my screen, uh, I will publish all the demos on the on the uh, GitHub probably. Uh, so I'll share the link with probably on Twitter so that you can actually uh, download all the things that I couldn't show and say, see for yourself that, that they actually work. Um, what, what else? I will also publish the, the presentation obviously so you can actually uh, just, just scan through the, the slides. Not so much information on them, so I guess it's not really that useful. But uh, the demo scripts will definitely be there, so you can actually download them and just just see for yourself. And I strongly invite you to yeah, tomorrow 
uh, the, this, this uh, one of the bigger hall uh, rooms, I guess. Uh, so together with uh, Joey and, and uh, Ben, we'll try to keep you entertained and hopefully we won't have any issues like we had today. Um, and um, I also want to invite you to, to my last session of uh, last day. I know that it's late. It's like second to last slot, but it's stuff expansion plus plus, and I think that's something. If you are like me, and you make a typo in every second word, you probably start investigating and uh, using uh, tough expansion plus plus. So thank you very much.